everyone for coming. Thanks everyone for coming today. Really appreciate it. And um, I thought I would start just and give you. Oops, I'm supposed to use this, right? I thought I would just say a few words about the Co Foundation, the Ralph T. Co Foundation for the Arts, and why we're partnering with SAR and what we're all about, and why this uh, the series this year with that I've been working on with Alicia has done a fantastic job as usual. Thank you very much for, for helping so much and putting this, pulling this together. And to Daniel as well, who's behind the camera, who's done so much to pull this together. Um, but the point of it is, is the Co Foundation, Ted Co, many of you might have known him, was a collector curator uh, here in town. He moved here in the early 80s. He had created an exhibition in Kansas City called Sacred Circles. He followed Sacred Circles, which was mainly historic pieces, with something called Lost and Found Traditions, uh, about native traditional arts. And he did that through the late 70s into the mid 80s. And he traveled tens of thousands of miles looking uh, for traditional artists, traditional native artists. The point is, nothing was lost or found. It was a matter only for Ted to go and, and talk to people and bring their work forward so the non-native world would know something about that as well. But we have, Ted left his collection in a small endowment. We have set up, we're just past our first year anniversary of being over on Pacheco Street. We invite you to come over and see what we're doing. But we're trying to develop something. We don't even know what to call it yet. We call it sometimes a study center. Sometimes we call it a curatorial center. And we're searching for exactly how we fit into town. And we don't want to duplicate what other people do, but we want to be that place that facilitates, that advocates, that also is a catalyst. And part of working here in Santa Fe, or any place, really is developing those partnerships and collaborations. And so with the SAR, it's such a natural uh, place for us to have that collaboration. And another collaboration we'll have this summer is with the Wheelwright Museum of the American Indian, where we're gonna open a major exhibition July 25th um, uh, around Ted's collecting and around the idea of collecting, which is something that many of us share. So, it's a way for us, we don't need to duplicate or reinvent, but it's a way for us to, to continue on. Now, today's topic is something I would say perhaps is a bit selfish. This is something I've worked on throughout my career, is how to bring people in. It, 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 and bring people in, when I say that, I, that's pretty colloquial. But what I mean by that is, how do you bring Native people into the museum project? How do you bring Native people into the arts world where their voice is heard first? and that their voice is explaining uh, what you're seeing. And I've done that in many different ways throughout, throughout my career. And it's really always been a pleasure uh, to do that. And it's been an eye-opener every place I've gone, I've always learning things. Now at NMAI, for example, I just want to give you a couple examples of things. So we created NMAI, the National Museum of the American Indian Smithsonian in Washington. And there was a lot of expectations that surrounded the opening of the building. And many of you have been there, I assume. And one of the things about the, about the creation of the museum was that the building is very different. It's not gray granite like the rest of the buildings on the National Mall. It doesn't face the National Mall. But it actually, you come in on the corner of the building, the southwest corner of the building, you wind around the building, you go through different types of uh, environments. You go by the ducts and the water. You go by sculpture, and then you come around to the front, uh, which is facing to the east. I know there's a big white building uh, immediately to its east that many people think that doorway faces the east because of that, but we know it's looking <laughs> far beyond that white building on the hill. Um, and then you get into the, and so here's all your expectations. And you get inside the building, and you're, and, you're, and you're standing in the building, and you're in the space, and suddenly all your stuff kicks in. I don't know what to call it, but stuff. And your stuff is this. Your stuff is, you've been in museums before. You have a perception about native people. So all that kicks in for all the work of trying to get you reoriented. You walk in the museum and suddenly, you're now just in a museum. So your reaction to the exhibits, your reaction to artists working, uh, the artwork that you see may be just something that you bring with you instead of a reformulation or a new consideration of it that the museum hopes to do. I lost the battle at NMAI for a portal. And what I mean by that, we felt the exhibits were very differently done. But just dropping people in exhibits, again, we just use our baggage that we have. 
we don't have anything new to, uh, uh, unless we're sort of reoriented. So how do you do that? How do you uh, get people to stand a little different, look at a little different angle, and just see things differently? You don't have to toss out your knowledge, but just be open to receiving new, uh, new knowledge. Now the idea that Native people have been in museums, working with museums and working with art, uh, is a long standing, and over the last few decades have been wonderful changes, wonderful, wonderful changes. When this era sort of, sort of started in the 70s and 80s, museums often had their exhibition, and in the front of the exhibition would be a screen, like a video screen. And on the video screen would be the Native people talking, because you didn't want to get them inside the exhibition, per se. Uh, and then people started, and then an exhibition program started where people would come in, Native people would be asked to come in, and they would get to comment on the finished exhibition. And then I think the third and much better stage is you bring people at the very start in, and you work together to come up with a conceptualization, a plan, what the ex exhibition might be about. So there's a very long process that's still ongoing. <clears throat> Part of the emphasis for today is that we're not done, we're far from done. Um, that I think oftentimes, um, <coughs> that oftentimes that there's still a lot, lot of differences between the world that we need to, to learn to one another. Another time, at anime, I'm picking on NMAI because it's far away, it's so easy. <clears throat> so another time at NMAI, we were making a, the film for the theater, up the Lolly up, theater upstairs, and we were making that film, and we had these filmmakers out around the country, um, uh, around the hemisphere, I should say, and they came back and they had this piece of footage they'd taken at Rosebud Reservation up in South Dakota. And they said, well, we're gonna reshoot this piece of film because these two people who were sitting and speaking on film, the tree behind them is really distracting because it looks like it has all their dirty laundry in it. Ah, that's why I told that story. That dirty laundry is not their dirty laundry. There were prayer flags in the tree. So our own filmmakers at that point, um, we changed things around a bit and got them a native person actually from Santa Clara to follow them around and guide them a little better. <laughs> the other point I wanted to, <clears throat> excuse me, the other point I wanted to just say something about is I think there is a misperception sometimes that by having a native person uh, speak in a museum or an art or a scholarly uh, sort of context that we're getting the complete story. That a person like myself stands up, I can't possibly know very much about what I'm speaking about ever. That's another point. But I can't possibly know a, enough about uh, a native, native world, even as a bridge or a portal, uh, as an interpreter of that world. So you bring a native person in, and all three of our panelists today have been in this position, and you think you're getting the 100% entire story. But what we're going to explore today is that everybody edits what they say and reasons why people edit that narrative and what we can learn both from what is said and what goes unsaid in those narratives. And the last point about today, before I introduce the speakers, uh, our panels rather, is about making ourselves, the, really the selfish point about today is I really want to keep creating and making ourselves better receptors and better listeners. And what I mean by that is being open to what people say. It's, it's like seeing, seeing that tree and understanding that it may be distracting to a filmmaker, but it is not at all distracting to people who know what's going on with that tree, and that those people sitting there sharing their story, their narrative, have been so open to have that tree in the frame of, of the film. And we also, being in the Southwest too, something I always think about a lot is uh, people talk about the secrecy and there are a lot of things that are unsaid or unknown to outsiders. And there's, there's reasons for that. But if you pay attention and you go to dances and other things like that, most things are right in front of us all the time, even as outsiders. And learning how to see or to uh, just be quiet and listen well is really a lesson that we all need all the time. Now we have three panelists today and we're gonna to explore some of these topics. And Diane Reyna is, I hope, known to 
I hope all three of them are well known to you. And I'm very, very pleased that the three of them have been able to come today and share some of their perceptions. Diane is from Taos, Pueblo. She has a degree from the University of New Mexico. I think when she was the camera woman at KOAT, she was not only the first native person, but first woman camera person in the state, I believe. From that, she went on and made a very important uh, film called Surviving Columbus, which was uh, aired in 1992. And Diane said about that film, um, a lot of tribes have gone through this type of history, meaning Columbus and, and the types of histories here with the uh, Spanish settlement. And, and she said, I hope it does educate non-Indians at least to see and allow another perspective on history. That was the most important part of doing this documentary. Now, uh, in 1998, Diane was one of the Dubin Fellows here at the school where she practiced her art, both drawing and sculpture. And currently, she is the Student Success Program Coordinator at the Institute of American Indian Arts, where she shepherds students through the program. And I understand her atoli is famous. <laughs> Uh, Brian Vio is known to many of you, and Brian spoke yesterday. Brian's currently the interim director of the Indian Arts Research Center, and he has over 25 years' experience working in the Southwest. Um, he was the founding director of the Office of Tribal Historic Preservation and the Haku Museum and Visitor Center in uh, Acoma, and also was the key person in the design of the building. He's also a painter, if you're lucky enough to get one of his paintings. <laughs> but, um, and, um, and he indicated yesterday in his talk that uh, NAGPRA had a lot to do with his interest in these topics. Uh, and um, in building the visitor center at, um, and museum at, at Acoma, uh, there's always things that are said. There's a way to, you know, you can look at that visitor center and museum in many different perspectives, but certainly one of his perspectives is it really controls visitors into the space that's the Pueblo of Acoma. The third person is uh, w Joseph Woody Aguilar, known as Woody. And I've always confused in my own email because it comes up as Joseph Aguilar, and I don't know who that is. <laughs> um, and I didn't ask you, like, his mom told us we were at feast day a, a year or so ago, and, his, and I always thought the Woody thing was like something uh, different, but I'll just tell you just a short version of this. It really is a nickname from his Tewa, or Indian name. So there's a perception thing that I thought it comes from some other place. Woody is here at the school this year uh, as a scholar in residence. He's finishing his dissertation uh, on, on an aspect of the Pueblo Revolt from um, in, at the University of Pennsylvania. And he has been called the rising star of the Pueblo Revolt literature world and investigation world. I would really agree with that. And one of the most profound experiences I've had in the last decade or so was actually with Woody. Uh, we went up to Tunio, or Black Mesa, that stands between Santa Clara and San Aldefonso, the place where Tewa people defended themselves from the resettlement of Spanish people here, and uh, really fought to a standoff. And while we were up there, um, uh, you know, it's like Woody's standing there, and it's like going on any other tour, right, that he's talking about this place and his discoveries and what he's doing as an archaeologist and as a scholar, and then something sort of clicks in, and you realize you're standing there, not just with anyone, but you're standing there with a descendant of people that went there and lived there for nine months to defend their way of life and their culture. So it, it is another type of narrative that's unspoken, but it's very much there. So the purpose then today is to continue to build the dialogue and to create more dialogue and create something that's less cluttered and what I mean by less cluttered is that some of our preconceived notions or perceptions are left at the door. And finally, I think a very important part of this is to correct the record. So I wanted to start then, um, and the way we're going to structure this is I have some questions that I'll go on with until they start talking on their own. And then we'll open up the, towards the end uh, for people's questions of the audience and make it really participatory for everyone in the room. So I wanted to ask then as a start, and we're gonna start with Diane on the other end, you're in luck. Um, but Diane, I just, wanted, I just wanted each of the three of you to just talk for a moment about who is, your, who is your audience, and does your thinking when you're creating something, 
uh, and thinking about your audience, how does that um, influence what you're doing? Um, audience is critical. Uh, when I talk to young native filmmakers, video makers, um, at the institute or whoever, it, it is, the, or if people want to come uh, and ask for help on, on their script or their story, the first question I do ask them is, who's your audience? Uh, for uh, technical reasons, because if you have, if you know a specific audience, you don't have to explain as much. But if it's for a general audience, then you have to, like in Surviving Columbus, you really have to tell the whole story. Everything. Um, but if, if I was making Surviving Columbus for just Taos Pueblo people, there's a lot of stuff I could have, that I could leave out, because it's already inferred and unknown, you know, known to a certain degree. So audience is critical. Um, with surviving, it was, a, it was unusual because I had two audiences, because the task was to inform a general audience, which was the world, and, um, but at the same time, I had a, a, we had a responsibility um, to our own communities to get the story as um, appropriate as we could. So um, I was actually working uh, to fulfill two audiences. This is a very tricky thing, but my main audience was the Pueblo people because that story, whether if that was, um, uh, you know, they, I needed their approval. And their, uh, because if we didn't do this right, there's a lot of pressure to get this right, uh, there, was, there was going to be reper repercussions for all of us, the, non the native uh, part of this collaboration. So, um, it, but we, we managed to do both. Uh, when I got feedback from the public people, it, it worked for them, and I got feedback from gen the general audience, it worked for them. So uh, it's rare, but uh, it can be done. But again, you know, a narrative is about a lot of times allegiance, especially for me. Um, where, where, are my, where are my allegiances? And so my allegiance is to the public people first, and then, and so then everybody else comes after. Brian, same sort of question. Uh, you know, who's, who's your audience, and then you know, how does your preparation of the work um, prepare for that audience? Well, I'll use the um, Sky City Cultural Center and Agua Museum as the example here. Um, at the time, I was the director of the Historic Preservation Office, so um, the audience there was really the, the tribal community. Um, and fortunately, having grown up in the community, I was well connected to, to the right people to get that job done and get the program started. And then transitioning from that particular uh, role into the then manager of the tourist center and uh, organize, and that's what they called me as the organizer, the organizer for uh, the development of the new cultural center uh, in response to losing the visitor center to the fire, um, I realized very quickly that the audience was uh, reached far beyond the reservation boundaries, that Acoma had a, an international presence and that it included all walks of life, your visitor, your, your families, uh, scholars, uh, researchers, anthropologists, all these people who, who had an interest in Acoma. So it was very, very wide-ranged and diverse. And that was challenging for me um, and, and our core team of, um, of, of folks who were uh, embarking on this project. Um, but we always, um, we proceeded with the idea that, as Diane just indicated, our community is, is the first audience <laughs> and the primary audience. And that whatever we do, uh, whatever we undertake in, in this process, that the community, uh, that audience needs and um, vision were, were achieved and, and provided for uh, in, throughout the process. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
my, my pri primary audience is uh, my community. Um, I mean, the, the work I, I do is very selfless. Um, and it's, 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 uh, it's not to self-promote myself, which is, which is a lot of what academia is about. <clears throat> and I learned that very quickly when I went to a place uh, like the University of Pennsylvania. Very competitive, very, uh, you know, um, uh, self-promotion self going on, um, a lot of competition. Um, and I knew uh, almost immediately um, just being immersed in an, in an environment like that, that um, uh, my motivation and, and my audience uh, is is my community, my 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 people, um, and so that's what drives the work that I do. Um, I mean, because the work I'm doing is it doesn't belong to me. Um, uh, it doesn't belong to the United States. In some sense, it kind of does because it's part of that larger history. But it belongs to the community. It belongs to the table communities who. Um, you know, occupied the place where um, I'm doing my research. Um, so that's those. That's my primary audience is my community, um, and um, for many Native people, and you know, Diane and uh, Brian, um, we have similar kind of motivations for the work we do. Um, that being uh, our communities. Um, but I guess I have more than one audience, and I, I struggle in my own work. And we've had discussions here at SAR about um, how to reach these different audiences, um, because you can't do that in any one single piece of work, any one dissertation, any one journal article, uh, magazine article, what have you. Um, so I often struggle in my own work, in my own writing, to uh, reach my primary, primary audience who I'm pretty sure will not pick up my dissertation <laughs> and, and read every single page of however many pages it ends up being. Uh, I'm sure they won't pick up, uh, you know, a, a chapter I have um, in a recent, uh, you know, edited volume or something that might come out in American antiquity. antiquity. Um, it's not that public people or people from my, my community are illiterate. Um, it's just that we have different ways of learning um, and that is not through picking up pieces of paper. Um, you know, my, my, my grandfather and a lot of old men say a lot of times <coughs> that, um, like, uh, paper is not, or like w words on paper are, aren't, aren't worth as much as, as what you learn or what you see or what you do from experiencing things. Um, and I really take that into, um, into heart, uh, that type of, uh, kind of advice and knowledge that I've got from them. Um, and so that's my secondary audience. So I, 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 I try hard to reach my primary and my secondary audience. Um, my dissertation committee is part of that, um, that audience. So in, in this kind of stage where I'm at now, I'm trying to cater to them as well and make them happy so I can graduate and finish. Um, so I, I realize that you know, there's, there's certain people I, ha I, I have to speak to I must speak to. Um, and I guess a third audience uh, would be like the public, uh, you folks. Um, and I, I really enjoy, um, and I really thank you, Bruce, for um, you know, creating this, this type of space and SER creating this type of space to, to reach this audience. Um, you know, because the work I, I do, I, I wanted to inform you know, Tewa people, Pueblo people, San Alfonso people, um, I wanted to influence uh, scholarship. I wanted to influence academia, how uh, other archaeologists think, um, the methodologies they use. Um, you know, I, uh, I, m my research is collaborative. I'd like more archaeology to be collaborative. We see a lot of that here in the Southwest. Um, and I think in, if, in any small way if, if the work I do um, can influence that um, and reach these different audiences, um, I, I'd be very happy. We'll come back to you in a moment to give a breath to take here. Sure. I was wondering, Brian, in, in your work, um, because you've worked so much uh, from the perspective of, of your community and inside the community, uh, 
uh, working then um, with visitors to the community. If there was a narrative, if you can go back in time, if that was possible, and take back a narrative about the Southwest, about Native people, Pueblo people, or even as specifically as Acoma Pueblo, I wonder if there's a narrative that, that, that kind of almost like a master narrative that stands in the way more than any other narrative. And on the other side of that, is there a more, more positive way of looking at that same question? Is there a master narrative that's actually working well to, to integrate uh, the outside world into uh, your community? <clears throat> Good question. <laughs> I guess in my experience, um, my early years in, in uh, education in the BIA school system, um, it, was, it was fascinating to me to learn about Indians, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and it was very, I mean, it was a very Western-based um, idea of, of a very glamorized picture of what Native Americans were. Um, and and, I, and I, I think at some point in that schooling, I had the idea that, yeah, there were still Indians walking around in war bonnets and living in teepees. Because that's what we learned about. That's what we were exposed to. The culture in my life way as a child was something that wasn't really different to me. I mean, it was, it was my life way. And so anything outside of that context was very interesting to me. So later on, of course, um, doing some work in, in this field in, in historic preservation really opened my eyes to uh, the scholarship that um, had that was available the, the, uh, to that point in terms of how Acoma or the Southwest was portrayed, how the cultures of the Southwest were portrayed. And I had a big interest in the archaeology uh, component um, and was really fascinated <coughs> by the ancestral homelands of the Pueblo people. And um, I knew about the references culturally but to really ex explore more about the, the research and the tons of research <laughs> about places like Chaco and Mesa Verde um, and the fact that these were national parks was really interesting to me. Uh, but I think it also helped me later on when I came into this role at the Cultural Center um, that there are so many different perceptions out there about what Native America is, uh, what, wh who we are, and, and Acoma's history um, in, in tourism activity, <clears throat> you know, that, that narrative has evolved over time. Um, as I s mentioned yesterday, in the, one of the first scripts that we came across in 1904 was, okay, this is the church. <laughs> you know, basic things like that that the volunteer tour guides were, were sharing with visitors coming to Acoma. This is the plaza. This is po the pottery. This is how we make pottery. We go over there to get water. Um, things like that. And so that particular script, if you will, that narrative, over time, of course, has become much more refined. And we've taken great care in informing ourselves of the history that's available outside of Acoma and taking our own um, traditional knowledge and, and knowledge of our own history to create a more comprehensive, or more, not comprehensive, but um, uh, a, a presentation, I guess, about who we are. So um, I suppose that that will continue to evolve as time goes on, uh, because we continue to add. Um, and as we learn about more work, some like what uh, Woody is currently uh, working on about the, the Pueblo Revolt 
you know, we all want to find ways to integrate that type of knowledge and research coming from a fellow Pueblo person into our programs, programming. So, so Diane, sort of, the, sort of the same question, but looking at the perspective of um, the students that are coming to IAIA, you know, again, uh, those students live within some types of narratives from their own communities, and perhaps the broader society uh, narratives about who Native people are or are supposed to be. So I'm wondering if you could just talk a little about your experience with students uh, at, at the Institute. <coughs> um, it's very interesting uh, what Colin's <coughs> saying, because we come from these communities, and the most important word I learned in college was ethnocentric. And, uh, and that taught me, you know, that, that that's what raised in these types of communities were to us and it's the center of the world. So when I, I, when I started going to IAI and uh, working there, I started to see people that I had only seen in the World Book Encyclopedia, Seminoles, uh, Alaskan people, people from Oklahoma, um, just all these uh, dots of Man Mandan people, and um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a wonderful um, place uh, where much of the learning among the students and the staff faculty is really outside the classroom because there's that sharing, well, we do it this way, we do it this way, or you know, we have this food this time and all that. And, uh, and so um, uh, that's the first part. And then, um, but second part is that the stories and the narratives that they bring is, 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 is the most important thing because uh, with, with those different tribal affiliations, you get to see the complexities of uh, their life experience, how much they were affected if they were a, uh, from Penobscot, from Massachusetts, how much that impact of their history has on their own cultural understanding versus somebody from Hopi. And so you get those kind of conversations going. And then at the same time, sometimes um, um, there is judgment among uh, Indian people about other Indian people. Um, but getting back to uh, what Bruce was talking about, we, this is my motivation and my understanding about uh, uh, supporting students is that, you know, we're new to college education. We're only, uh, you know, about, what, a hundred years where, like, my mother got her first degree in the 40s, and they were, those were the first people that were getting from Pueblo country uh, college education, so we're very, very new to this experience. So understanding that, then, uh, then my job is to fill the students in on the importance of higher education and how it works and how it is congruent and incongruent with their own experience. Um, so uh, I start from that experience because I work with a lot of first generation students. And um, so it's about, people say coddling, but you know, when people say coddling, it's like those are the people that have had grandparents in college, that have had uh, parents in college, that have had aunts and uncles, role models in college, and that whole concept of, you know, uh, um, I'm sure a lot of you talk, heard people saying, you know, you won't be here, you look around you, you won't be here in the next uh, uh, year, uh, a lot of you are going to fail in what, um, uh, what he is going through too. It's, it's where we approach education from a different context, which is this is for our survival, this is our improvement of our communities. And so um, <coughs> what I am is filling in the blanks because that a lot of students don't have that college experience, so they have to understand how, how it works. And, um, uh, and it's as simple as, as going through the college catalog and defining terms and defining uh, processes and procedures and, um, and then, uh, so things aren't as intimidating because when I went to college and that was in the 70s, I was expected to know this stuff. We didn't have an orientation, you know, we were expected, you know, they were 30,000 students. If I didn't come back the next semester, who was gonna care? You know, but there's so many things to get done uh, in our communities that we 
we can't afford uh, not to support students who want to, to get that education, and we, we do what it takes. Maybe come back to you, Woody, and um, maybe could you expand a little bit on what Diane is saying? Also, um, I, I'm, I'm just very curious about uh, um, how, how you're balancing. Um, so you're writing for a committee, dissertation committee, and you're writing for a university, right? Uh, yet yet you're, you're saying that your first look is really to the people in the community itself. So I'm just wondering a little bit about that balance and then also, uh, if you could comment a little bit on uh, if you're having some similar uh, types of things going on as Diane has described for some of the students at IA. Okay, I want to first make a, like, a brief comment on narrative. Um, as it relates to like, uh, New Mexico colonial history or uh, Pueblo history or the Pueblo revolt, um, you know, the narrative, the accepted narrative, um, for many historians in the past, uh, Borderlands uh, scholars, um, has been the narrative written by the uh, you know early Spanish settlers, De Vargas, um, Oderman, um, Coronado, um, and has been interpreted, reinterpreted by Borderland scholars, um, historians, and it's been accepted as the narrative um, for you know Pueblo and colonial New Mexico history. Um, so what I present, or what I think I, I'm presenting is like a, a counter narrative or a counter history or an alternative history. And Sev uh, does like similar kind of things with his work with the Comanche. Um, but why, like why is like our narrative, Pueblo narrative counter? Why is it the alternative? Why is that the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the other history? Um, you know, we talk about the othering a lot in anthropology, and um, I feel sometimes uh, in my own work, I struggle with, with othering my history. Um, and so I, I, it's important to challenge these, these narratives, um, and be critical of them, which, which I, I try to do, and I think a lot of other archeologists like Sev and my advisor, um, Matt Liebman, um, <clears throat> do a, a decent job at, I think, um, so I just wanted to address narrative uh, very quickly. Um, and I forgot the other question. <laughs> uh, I was just asking if you'd comment on, you. I was asking if you would comment a, a bit on the sort of track that Diane was talking about, that um, you're writing for the community first and your first responsibility is to San Alfonso and Tewa people, yet you're being asked to write a dissertation <clears throat> at the University of Pennsylvania. And just a little bit, if you could, Maybe share a few personal observations about that. Yeah, so like I mentioned, the work I'm doing is collaboration with um, uh, San Alfonso Pueblo. So through myself and through University of Pennsylvania. Um, and I get challenged by um, other grad students at Penn, um, other archaeologists at Penn, other professors who question that, um, that maybe the restraints uh, put on my research, um, other restraints by, in general, by, by tribes or tri indigenous peoples put on the research that archaeologists do might be too restrictive um, for good, you know, quote unquote, scientific in inquiry. Um, but that hasn't been uh, the case, like at least in my work, my collaborative work, or the case uh, with, with, you know, my advisor or my colleagues who do work with Coach Di Pueblo and Hamas Pueblo. Um, in fact, I think it's been, it's had the opposite effect. You know, collaboration, it kind of uh, opens new doors uh, to communication. Um, um, and in, in a lot of ways, um, maybe this is just because I'm, I'm from the Pueblo and I grew up there. And in, uh, to a lot of like elders or tribal council people, I'm still viewed as that little, um, they, they have a, a, like a slang and table, like a little snotty-nosed um, kid. Um, and so I think their, their criticisms of me and, and the work that I do um, are much more stringent than any kind of standards that the academy can put on me. Um, 
And so, you know, dealing with the standards of the academy at Penn or, uh, you know, other archaeologists um, seems like a breeze <laughs> to me after, after you know, being scrutinized um, very closely by, by, you know, elders and people you grew up with um, who have, a, like, a real stake in, in the work that I do. Um, so, um, in, in that way, um, I, I forgot exactly where I was going with this, but um, um, I mean that's that's one of the ways that helped me kind of create better better scholarship, and it's not restrictive. It, in fact, it's uh, it's much more um, it's broadened. I think my my research and it's broadened the research of of other archaeologists. I think um, working in this in this way. Thanks, Woody. Um, so so Brian, I was just wondering if you would take that point of um, how, how, how the, the, your own community has um, imp improved the ability to do your work. And maybe if you have a, an example or two of how working on behalf of your community or for your community within your community has, has changed for positive the way, the things that you've done both not just at the visitor center and historic preservation, but even something here at the school and the sorts of things you're doing here. Um, and how, 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 is that, how does that impact um, on a big picture and a daily picture sort of way? Well, I like to think that <clears throat> my involvement at the tribal level has helped to foster a new way of thinking about things, uh, thinking about economic development in a much broader way than what maybe the tribal council or, or community view as economic development. Um, you know, we've, we've worked very hard to create a process of um, educating ourselves about things and um, so from not only with, with economic development, but also education. It's certainly as a result of tourism activity at Acoma, as a result of creating a vision for what historic preservation is and can be for at, at Acoma in terms of architecture, culture, language, community, family, it's certainly um, become part of the, 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 um, the tribal structure. And it's, it's something that um, thankfully the community embraces and have a, an interest in uh, having a, or discussing. So when you talk about economic development, it's all encompassing. It doesn't just mean making money in some way. There, it goes far beyond that. And um, I think that it's, it's really great to see that. Working on the outside, um, and, and now here at SAR, uh, I, and the work that the IARC has been engaged in over the, well, in the recent um, years, and developing a process for uh, consultation, the collaborative consult consultation initiative is, is a great model. It is important, I think, um, to creating and, and improving and updating the narrative of, of this important collection here and the purpose of, of having the pieces here. Um, it's starting a whole different discussion also at the tribal level, um, and I'll use Zuni as that example of, you know, really making a commitment to work with an institution like SAR to help them do their 
do some preservation to help them to improve the record for their own community, for the future of uh, tribal members. And um, while this collection maintains its place here, the accessibility to this collection is, is um, it's, more, it's more open, certainly. Uh, and I think that this is probably one of the most important things that's happened. Uh, as I've worked with SAR in the past on, on different projects, you know, the, there's a whole history there and uh, experience that, you know, from the outside looking in and trying to open the door, <laughs> it was always very difficult. And, um, and now it seems that uh, as a result of this commitment on both the part of the tribes and um, who are represented in the collection and also SAR, that, you know, we're bridging some really... Um, important gaps that have been separated for, for so long. And I hope that, you know, it will uh, feed or, or encourage other institutions to do something similar. Uh, I think that in the future, uh, the work of museums um, who have uh, extensive collections of Native American material culture will find that there is a, a true benefit in, in um, creating uh, those partnerships and and creating that narrative um, and and the scholarship uh, developing the scholarship in in close partnership with those uh, tribal groups <laughs>